Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dolika Jyoti Sharma from the Department of English, Guwahati University. Today I will speak on Module 21 of Paper 13, which is UN Resolution 1325. During the course of this module, I will speak on the various aspects of this resolution, as well as speak on uh, the qualities or the aspects, uh, the special aspects of this resolution. And I will also try to look at uh, whether certain changes need to be done to ratify that resolution. The United States Security Council adopted resolution 1325 in its 4,213th meeting on 31st October 2000. The resolutions identify the changing nature of warfare and acknowledge the increasing vulnerability and targeting of women during conflict. So this resolution is about uh, the relation between women and conflict and the experience of women, the trauma sustained by women in particular during times of conflict. The United Nations recognized and addressed the significance of women's roles as peacemakers. Earlier, women were excluded from participation in peace processes. It emphasized the importance of women in peacekeeping decisions and international decision making. The four pillars of this resolution uh, are participation, firstly, involving women in peacekeeping at both national and international levels. The second is protection of the health of women, both physical and mental, and economic security of women. Prevention is the third pillar, focusing on efforts to prevent sexual and gender-based violence. It also includes prevention of exploitation by peacekeeping forces. Now, this is a very important part of this resolution because frequently the violence on women during conflict is more on, uh, more on the lines of uh, sexual violence, uh, which, is why, uh, uh, which is why women become very easy to, uh, targets on both sides of a conflict. So this resolution uh, importantly looks at this particular aspect of women's experience and uh, exploitation during war. The fourth important uh, aspect, the fourth pillar of this resolution is relief and recovery. That should include equal distribution of food and emergency aid uh, to men, women, young girls and boys and being gender sensitive in organizing relief of operations. What this means is that uh, there shouldn't be, first of all, uh, a discrimination between men and women or boys on, and, and girls regarding relief uh, and recovery of, uh, of people, of civilians. And at the same time, however, this resolution also makes way for uh, a special sensitivity to the requirements of women, uh, which is why this is another, yet another very important aspect of this resolution. The resolution takes note of the fact that the civilian population is not accidentally caught in warfare but are being specifically targeted by armed groups. Resolution 1325 recognized the role of women in conflict prevention, conflict resolution and decision making. It also recognized the urgency of having a gender perspective in peacekeeping strategies. The recommendations of the Windhoek uh, declaration and the Nambia plan of action are important in this regard. This resolution consists of 18 provisions to help women participate in peace negotiations. It will be elaborated in a later unit. The Security Council resolution identifies as also a few international laws that refer to the rights and protection of women and girls and calls on armed extremist groups to respect laws related to the protection of women and girls as civilians in armed conflict. The four Geneva Conventions adopted in 1949 and their additional protocols adopted in 1977 form the main core of international humanita uh, humanitarian law. Article 27 of the fourth Geneva Convention provides that First, women 
shall be especially protected against any attack on their honor, in particular against rape, enforced prostitution or any form of indecent assault. It is important to note that this resolution thereby identifies the sexual attacks on women, the sexual violence on women as by far the most crucial, the most important way in which women, uh, through which uh, women are victimized in during times of conflict. Amnesty clauses in peace agreements enable some parties to go unpunished during conflict. The resolution 1325 assigns responsibility to all governments to punish those who are committing crimes against women. This resolution further makes provisions for the security and safety of women in refugee camps. The Security Council resolution also requested initially the Secretary General to conduct a study on women in armed conflict and their role in peace building. This is because documentation, actual documentation, the actual gathering of facts and figures of, uh, of uh, the role of women in war and conflict is very important to provide a realistic picture of what women go through in particular during times of conflict. Uh, a report on the basis of this request on women, peace and security was submitted to the Security Council in October 2002. Finally, this act, uh, this resolution requests the Secretary General to address and report to the Security Council its progress on its gender sensitive approaches in peacekeeping operations. A recent analysis of 264 reports of the Secretary General to the Security Council dating from January 2000 to the present was conducted by the Office of the Special Advisor on Gender Issues and Advancement of Women, short for OSAGI, to ascertain to what degree the reports address gender perspectives as required in the Security Council resolution. The analysis reveals that only 17.8% of the reports made multiple references to gender concerns, 15.2% made minimal reference, and very interestingly, 67% of the reports make no or only one mention of women or gender issues. So we can see uh, that even though the resolution does provide for, uh, provide specially for women's requirements, uh, the actual realities show that the reports provided hardly uh, feature any experience of women, which is why uh, the requirement, which is why it is the need of the hour for uh, need of the hour to actually uh, take a concerned approach towards how we, uh, towards uh, the fate of women or the experience of women in these circumstances there are of course there is of course a uh, change uh, somewhat in the contemporary times about women's involvement in the war in 2000 when the resolution was adopted the major issues facing women in situations of conflict were the all-round sexual violence, losing children or loved ones to the conflict, being forced to or voluntarily becoming a combatant, and or being displaced from their homes for longer periods of time. Today, the scenario has changed, and it is seen that along with the existing issues concerning women, there have been other emerging concerns, such as the nature of warfare that invades one's personal and private spaces, like the family and community, where women are the most secured and protected. They live in a state of constant threat and impossible choices with insecurity and vulnerability. In 2000, when the Security Council passed this resolution, after the wars in Bosnia and Rwanda, the world was comparatively a better place to live in, especially around the concerns regarding women, peace, security, children and armed conflict. However, the nature of easy consensus has changed over the issues concerning women. The political process and the process of a policy implementation is far more polarized. 
both within the Security Council and outside. And decisions are taken at a slow pace because of distrust and fears of hidden political agendas. So we see that even though it is the United Nations, it is still ridden with political uh, propaganda, political ends, uh, which is why probably uh, women are not getting their fair share of attention even during times of conflict. This polarization and distrust have taken a toll on the women, peace and security agenda and the other thematic items on the agenda of the Council. This has led to the slowing of the momentum of the smooth functioning of the implementation of this resolution. For such reasons, there was a conviction among stakeholders that the next decade of women, peace and security, that besides seeking support and gains from within the Security Council, they should also begin to identify other forums and institutions to propel the issues forward. Uh, so because of the political angle that has entered into the Security Council, uh, the stakeholders are now looking for other options than the Security Council so that the case for women can be given a proper hearing. For many years, peace meant ceasefire and establishing a formal political system as a way of governance. However, today it is recognized that the definition of peace goes way beyond just silencing or ending violence. Peace comes to be defined hereby as a commitment to the restoration of human rights and deals with bringing justice and reconciliations among conflicting groups. The Preventing Conflict and Transforming Justice Securing the Peace, a global study on the implementation of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 states that, over time, research has shown that sustainable peace is only possible if there is inclusive peacemaking. Now this term inclusive in peacemaking suggests the uh, the, the, the equal participation of men and women as, as determiners of peace, as makers of peace. So the peacemaking process is not polarized, is not polarized uh, according to gender. It also becomes a platform of gender equity. Now, the nature of security has also changed over time. So, in earlier times, in earlier eras, the definition of security was seen in the context of the absence of violence. Today, the definition of security is seen in a more expansive way that is not only limited to containing physical violence. Security also has political, economic and social dimensions to it. Security now means both public and private. According to the Preventing Conflict and Transforming Justice, uh, Securing the Peace, uh, security in the old paradigm was linked to ensuring the survival of individuals. In recent times, it is recognized as a broader term aimed at securing the well-being of individuals and their communities. While women were not a major factor in the earlier definitions of security, current approaches which include security in the home and the community, make them central actors and stakeholders. So what happens is that uh, conflict or arm, uh, armed warfare anywhere is not limited nowadays to the battleground. It seeps into one's personal uh, space as well, like the family, the environment. So this report emphasizes this aspect of uh, of conflict, that it is not public, it has become also private. The United States Resolution 1325 was a great success with its four pillars of prevention, participation, protection, and peace building and recovery. And it has become a significant point in dealing with the challenges of women. But at the same time, 17 years later, the world political policy implementation and intercountry and interstate dynamics have changed, which is why the stakeholders from humanitarian organizations have felt that 1325, with its slow pace, has been lagging behind 
in dealing with many current issues of women, especially in the matters of women, peace and security. Which uh, makes a case for the ratification of this particular resolution in accordance with modern times. In Africa and Asia, the many have acknowledged the need to deal firmly with those who break the law with impunity and sexual violence. More often, the agenda would be limited to reparations, livelihoods and economic empowerment. There was a belief that the normative framework had to be localized and that there should be greater attention to localizing these agendas as per the concerns of the women. Resolution 1325 will be successful only if it's flexible and takes into account the concerns of the women that differ according to their specific locations and regions. For many women, Resolution 1325 is not a success because it fails to work at the grassroots level. It does not address or understand the specific local, ethnic and cultural problems of the women. Only when it acknowledges these concerns in today's time and space will it be a success. Because when you talk about women's experience, it is never a homogenized experience. So, for example, a woman uh, from Sri Lanka will have a different experience given the context of the, the Singhala Tamil civil war. While on the other hand, uh, a survivor of the Nelly massacre in Assam will have a slightly different experience because of the different kinds of uh, conditions uh, prevalent here. Or for example, a woman uh, in uh, the Northeast all right, will have a different experience of terrorism than say a woman from Kashmir or say a woman from Punjab. So which is why the experience of women cannot be homogenized and it is uh, a fault of the UN resolution that it tries to in a way level all these differences. So the, the need of the hour is again to incorporate these differences in women's experience. Uh, let's go on to how the nature of peace has changed over times as well. Over the years, the definition of peace uh, has transformed. Earlier, peace meant silencing the gunfire, that is ceasefire, as we have mentioned earlier, and restoring normalcy with proper state of government. In earlier years, ceasefires and demobilization were the main focus of peace processes. However, today, the scenario has changed and the definition of peace has widened to include much more than ceasefires. I quote the report again because it states that peace has increasingly meant an inclusive political process, a commitment to human rights in the post-war period, and an attempt to deal with issues of justice and reconciliation. So peace does not necessarily mean merely the ending of war. It carries on beyond to the rehabilitation of people, to, uh, to the dialogues between parties concerned, and to arriving at a certain kind of negotiation or a sense of closure. Over time, research studies and observations reflect that sustainable peace is one of the most essential elements to the broader definition of peace. It should encompass the inclusivity with regard to women in particular, and both inclusivity of women in the peacemaking process and justice should be a part of the post-conflict peace restoration process. Now, what is transformative justice? Because it is a key part of this UN resolution. For centuries, justice meant punishing the perpetrators who commit crimes against individuals. Considering the nature of conflict and war around the world, one cannot shift from the punitive notions of punishing convicts. Otherwise, it would mean giving impunity to the criminals. However, in current times, many aspects of justice have changed and currently, punitive aspects of justice encompasses calls for reparations and reconciliations too. Which means that uh, punishment is 
not the only end of justice. Justice also aims at bringing a certain reconciliation between parties, which includes, therefore, which necessarily includes a certain degree of forgiving and understanding. Now, transformative justice or the idea of transformative justice seeks to strike a balance between punishment and this, uh, and this creation of a certain balance between punishment and forgiveness because otherwise reconciliation is not possible. The UN has changed over the years as well. In 2000, the United Nations was largely seen as a development and humanitarian organization and the United Nations Development Program was seen as its chief instrument, especially at the grassroots level. But today, with a $9 billion budget, the UN peacekeeping appears to be the core mandate of the United Nations. Though this change hasn't been welcomed warmly by on all sides, the proactive peace operations have often been critiqued. Some of the criticisms include that the responses to peace operations are ad hoc and no proper planning is done. This change has affected women the most with the special protection and attention they require. Eventually, the UN's role in the protection and securing of civilians, that is men, women and children, has now become the supreme concern of the member states of the United Nations as well as of public opinion in general. The failure of a heightened attention on development and social and economic rights that are essential to the everyday lives of women by the United Nations and the Security Council means that there is a lack of proper understanding of the issues emerging now, lack of a proper framework for working on these issues and mobilizing their forces on these essential matters. Hence, the complete realization of the resolution 1325 can be seen only when the concern authorities of the UNSCR 1325 find specific ways to overcome these problems. As far as the resolutions of the UN on women, peace and security are concerned, uh, there have been several such resolutions. Uh, it's primarily because the role of women in the process of peace building and in issues related to security have been steadily expanding. This is especially evident in countries like Afghanistan and Myanmar. However, in relation to the entry of women in politics, their role in this crucial area is still too little. It is to review the situation that the UN held a high-level review in October to assess the progress and challenges of the Resolution 1325 and to set new commitments. Incidentally, the resolution to uphold women's rights in conflict and their roles in peace and security completed 15 years in 2015. At the international level, the UN Security Council has so far adopted seven resolutions on women, peace and security. These are namely the Security Council Resolution 1325 in 2000, the, Sec uh, the Security Council Resolution 1820 in 2008, Security Council Resolution 1888 in 2009, 1889 again in 2009, 1960 in 2010, 2106 in 2013 and 2122 in 2013. Collectively, the resolutions provide UN peacekeeping with a framework for implementing and monitoring the women, peace and security agenda. Some of the Security Council resolutions that are particularly significant for the subject of sexual violence in armed conflict and peacekeeping are, first of all, Resolution 1325, uh, as already explained, this is the blueprint for gender and peacekeeping work for the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, in short DPKO, uh, which is rooted in Security Council Resolution 1325. This was the first resolution to address the disproportionate and unique impact of armed conflict on women. The Resolution 1889 emphasizes the role and importance of women in the peace building process. It further stresses 
the need to develop indicators for measuring progress in this area. The resolution 1880 of the UN is specially aimed at the sexual violence that is done as a war tactic or when it is used as an instrument. The manifestations of the violence can be in the form of rape, custodial torture, physical and mental violence when in prison, to mention only a few examples. The recognition of this fact and its direct impact on the peace building process is behind the promulgation of this resolution. It adds strength to the earlier resolution 1325 and demands that sexual violence be recognized as a war crime and those involved in the conflict be held accountable and action be taken to prevent this violence. It also asks that the governments punish those who are guilty of such crimes and suitable disciplinary measures be taken to protect women. The resolution 1888 follows resolution 1820 and focuses on the responsibility of the peacekeeping forces in protecting women and children from sexual violence at the times of conflict. Now of course this is because women and children are the most vulnerable as targets of sexual violence. It also makes a request to the security general for the appointment of a person who would be the special representative during armed conflict. The recently adopted resolution 1960 builds further on the same issue. As far as the interagency coordination to implement resolution 1325 is concerned, in order to ensure collaboration and coordination throughout the United Nations system in the implementation of this resolution, the Interagency Network on Women and Gender Equality established the Interagency Task Force on Women, Peace and Security, which is chaired by the Special Advisor on Gender Issues and Advancement of Women. As of 2004, the task force includes representatives from DAW or DESA, DDA, DPA, DPKO, DPI, ESCWA, ILO, OCHA, OHCHR, OHRM, OSAGI, SRSG or CAC, UNDP, UNFPA, UNHCR, UN Habitat, UNICEF, UNIFEM, UNU and WFP. The observers, IOM and the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security, they uh, look at or supervise the, the, uh, this task force and their work. In 2003, the task force developed an action plan on the implementation of the resolution and contributed to, uh, to the preparation of the Secretary General's study. The 2003 annual report described the achievements of the task force in 2002 and the 2004 annual report includes information on needs assessment checklists, briefing notes for Security Council missions and the analysis of gender content of Secretary General's report to the Security Council. There have been two reports by the Secretary General in particular on women, the 2002 study and report of the Secretary General and the 2004 report of the Secretary General on Women, Peace and Security. The 1325 resolution has been described as a landmark resolution on women, peace and security uh, adopted on 31st October 2000. This resolution reaffirms the important role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts, peace negotiations, peace building peacekeeping, humanitarian response and in post-conflict reconstruction and stresses the importance of their equal participation and full involvement in all efforts for the maintenance and promotion of peace and security. This resolution urges all actors to increase the participation of women and incorporate gender perspectives in all United Nations peace and security efforts. It also calls on all parties to conflict to take special measures to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, 
particularly rape and other forms of sexual violence, in situations of armed conflict. The resolution provides a number of operational mandates with implications for member states and the entities of the United Nations system. The Windhoek Declaration, taken on 31st May 2000, on the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Transitional Assistance Group at Windhoek, Namibia, looks at the desire for peace across men and women everywhere in the world, in a world that is increasingly being riveted by war. This uh, declaration, therefore, seeks to resolve conflict and bring about peace, reconciliation and stability in all communities around the world, their countries and through the United Nations and regional organizations. The United Nations peace operations have evolved from peacekeeping in its traditional sense towards multidimensional peace support system. As I explained earlier, peace is not only ending a war, it is also about rehabilitation. It is also about rebuilding all the infrastructure that has broke, broken down during the war. So far, women have been denied their full role in these efforts, both nationally and internationally. And the gender dimension in peace processes has not been adequately addressed. In order to ensure the effectiveness of peace support operations, the principles of gender equality must permeate the entire mission at all levels thus ensuring the participation of women and men as equal partners and beneficiaries in all aspects of the peace process, from peacekeeping, reconciliation and peace building towards a situation of political stability in which women and men play an equal part in the political, economic and social development of their country. So we see that the UN Resolution 1325 emphasizes the need, first of all, for gender equality as far as justice and peace building operations are concerned. And secondly, it looks at uh, sensitizing people and peacekeeping forces and political uh, authorities, governments across the world of the need to pay special attention to women's requirements, women's experience and the special condition the situation of women during times of war and with this we come to the end of the module thank you